Uh, anyway, I'm Pete down here at North Branch Nature Center. And tonight we're gonna do a program that will first get us really excited to, about all these amphibians by us and this fantastic time of year where we can see so many of them so readily. Uh, and then we'll learn a bit about um, how we can go about conserving them and uh, participate in this community science project. So you should see my screen now. There we go. All right. And uh, if you have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to just pop them in the chat. Um, or yeah, and when you pop them in the chat, I'll have a chance to get to them and address them as we go along. Well, great. So our amphibians here in Vermont, those are our frogs, our toads, and our salamanders. They're what brings us together today. And if you'll entertain me for just a minute, I'd like to talk about that word. Amphibian comes from two Greek words, amphi meaning both and bios meaning lives. And we're most familiar with the amphibians in their adult stage, like this spotted salamander there or this rubber spotted salamander that lives on my desk during migration season. Uh, they are a veritable dragon, an apex predator of the forest floor. They're the terror of all sorts of bugs and slugs and worms living underneath the leaves. But their, their larval phase, their infant phase, lives in, in puddles in the forest and they are also an apex predator. Uh, and they're eating all sorts of copepods, amphipods, fairy shrimp, and the larva, the aquatic form of a lot of the flying insects that we see uh, later in the year. So they've really managed to be like a figurative uh, big fish in a little pond at two distinct times in their lives and two distinct habitats. And that's tremendously cool and a really uh, useful evolutionary adaptation, but it also means that they have two habitat requirements. And because of that, there needs to be a lot of connectivity behind that. They're adult terrestrial ground-based form and their puddle-based form. Uh, so tonight we're gonna talk about three phases of amphibian ecology. Living, their day-to-day -day lives as adults, migrating, this special ecological event that happens this time of year on rainy nights, and then breeding, uh, why they're making this migration, this big scary long trip into these pools and puddles around our forests. Uh, we don't, oh. uh, first though, let's think about where our amphibians are right now. And I made this figure a couple weeks ago when we had a, a full blanket of snow across all the land. And right now that top layer might be a little patchy, but in a lot of places, there is still a frost line. The soil is frozen. And in that frozen soil, we'll find a couple species of frogs that over winter by just burrowing a few inches below the ground or even just under the leaves, then they flood their body with natural uh, antifreeze, uh, sugars, glycerols to protect their cells from freezing. And they just freeze solid like little frog ice cubes. Um, and yeah, and then the salamanders down here in the bottom left, this is a spotted salamander, the yellow spotted salamander and a blue spotted salamander they have an entirely different approach. Instead of being tolerant of freezing, they avoid freezing by following rodent tunnels or cracks around roots in the soil way, way below the frost line. Um, if folks have put in perhaps like a frost-free hydrant in their garden, they'll know that you have to dig down two, three, even four feet to get below that frost line. Uh, and that's where they are right now. And we'll return to this as we think about the timing of these amphibians migrating. Um, but for now, we're gonna start meeting some characters. We don't have time tonight to go through every amphibian. It's uh, that could, you could possibly find in Vermont, but we're gonna focus on three characters that kind of give us the breadth of the diversity out there. The first is the spotted salamander, this guy. Uh, and they are our mascot of this program. They have this beautiful, black and gray coloring with yellow spots that really calls to mind actually like an asphalt road. Uh, so they make a great mascot for us. They're extremely cute. 
Um, and they're really big for a salamander, for, for any amphibian. They're about the size of a Snickers bar and not like one of the little ones that you might get at, you know, any old Halloween stop. They're, they're the king size Snicker bar. If you got this in your Halloween candy, you would go back to that house every year for the rest of your life. And while they're common, they're the most common rank that the state uh, assigns to animals. Um, they are seldom seen because they're fossorial, meaning that they live most of their life underground. And when they do come out, they come out at night, which isn't typically when humans are out there poking around in the woods. Uh, Underground and in the leaf litter, they'll be eating crickets, worms, spiders, beetles, all sorts of different bugs, really anything they could fit in their rather large salamander mouth. Our next character is the wood frog, also extremely cute. They're about the size of a Reese's peanut butter cup. The big adults that are migrating this time of year are the size of a king size peanut butter cup, where the little tiny ones that hatch and come out of the vernal pools, puddles, and ponds. Uh, later in the summer, they'll be the size of about one of those little peanut butter cups that you might be more likely to find in your Halloween candy or thrown out at a 4th of July parade. Uh, like their name suggests, they are wood creatures. They live in forests and they also eat insects, slugs, snails, spiders, all sorts of different bugs. They're also common, just like the spotted salamander. Uh, but because uh, they don't live below ground, you're much more likely to see one of those, though it can be tricky. And if you look, uh, one really great distinguishing characteristic of them is their raccoon or bandit mask that goes over their nose, behind their eye. Um, and then another one is this dorsolateral ridge. Not many other of our other frogs have this. That's that little fold of skin that goes all the way from back behind their leg, all the way up to the corner of their eye. Great. Our next, our last character is the four-toed salamander, which are just real stunners. They're quite small compared to the other salamander we, we looked at today. They're about the size of a pack of Smarties. And they have these beautiful rusty backs with herringbone grooves and a distinct, really brilliant black and white spangled sides and bellies. Um, these actually were not likely to find uh, up in East Burke, but they live uh, in forests, especially in forested wetlands in the Champlain Valley. And they're also eating small bugs. And this is one of those species that is the greatest conservation need in Vermont. And they're truly adorable. One cool identifying feature of them is that if you look at the tail, where the tail meets the body behind their rear legs, there's a little notch. And that notch is actually where these animals can detach their tail. If a hungry possum or raccoon or bobcat picks this up by the tail, the four-toed salamander will drop its tail and the tail will wriggle and writhe around, uh, hoping to distract that bobcat or possum. And the possum, the, the predator will either go for the tail or just be so surprised that the animal that they're holding just fell in half uh, that it gives the four-toed salamander, the tailless at this point, four-toed salamander time to escape. And that's one of the reasons that we want to be really careful when we're handling these. We don't want to pick them up by the tail because if they lose that tail, they will survive, but it takes a lot of bugs. It takes a lot of calories to regrow a tail. And the next time that they come across a possum, they wouldn't have that, that ability to drop a tail since they're still regrowing it. And they might not be so lucky next time. But these are, oh, they're just really fantastic to look at. Uh, so living. We're, let's talk about where these adult four-toed salamanders are living right now. They're nocturnal, they're coming out only at night, and especially this time of year, when they're still hiding from the winter cold, they spend a lot of time in rodent burrows and root channels. They're not terribly good at digging, even though they're called mole salamanders, but they're really quite widespread on forest floors. Um, they're not uncommon, they're just kind of hard to see since we live above ground and tend to be active during the day. If you are gonna find them looking under logs or rocks is the place to, find, to look, because uh, they have to stay moist. Uh, they're looking for anything that can protect their humidity because their skin has to stay moist because that's how they breathe. Instead of breathing through lungs exclusively like we do, they can breathe through their wet skin as it diffuses oxygen. 
And while their bright yellow on black spots look really apparent on this, uh, this gravel road here in the background, once you put them in their natural habitat, a really diversely colored forest floor with leaf litter, with maple flowers, with different kinds of leaves, it actually really helps them break up their outline so that they can be less apparent and less visible to predators. They do pale in, pale in comparison though to the wood frog, which is extremely cryptic, extremely camouflaged. That dorsolateral ridge, actually I'll return to that in the next slide. Uh, these you are also common, but you're a little bit more likely to see them because they will be out at night or they will be out during the day. They mostly hunt at night when uh, they have a little bit more protection from uh, predators that use their eyes a lot, um, but they don't, they don't have that ability or that habit of going below ground to avoid uh, predators during the day. So you walking through the woods, you might stumble across these and it often, is the case in my experience at least that you don't see them first, you hear them first. You walk through the, the leafy woodlands and you hear the hop and you freeze and you look around and you can't quite make out where the wood frog is because here you can see they blend in really well. That black bandit mask really simulates uh, shadow being cast on, on the frog. And that dorsolateral ridge I was talking about that goes from the eye to their back leg really mimics the, the midrib of a dead leaf. So it can be really tricky to find them uh, even though they're, um, they are out during the day like this one was. And then our last character tonight, the four-toed salamander. Uh, they are rare, especially outside of the Champlain Valley. Um, but if you're, if you're touring, uh, further south in Vermont, you might come across them. They love forested wetlands and they are acid tolerant, but I'll say they're acid tolerant of naturally occurring acidic soils, maybe soils that are like have a rich history of pines being on there or have uh, some interesting geology going on. All amphibians are extremely intolerant. They're extremely sensitive to any sort of pollution, uh, be it mercury deposition or chemical split spill, uh, because they spend so much of their lives in water, um, they absorb a lot of those chemicals and it can lead to really strange and uh, unfortunate health outcomes for them. They might, um, the spotted salamanders, we know when they're exposed to pollutants, uh, their spots become a little less symmetrical. Um, but in really extreme cases, they might, uh, like grow another limb. And that's why a lot of biologists will use um, amphibians as kind of like a canary in the coal mine, a warning signal for uh, when environmental pollution um, is getting out of hand. Because, you know, the biologists can't go out and measure water quality in every single pond and puddle and pool and river. Uh, but if you can count the amphibians, uh, you can get a sense of what is a healthy unpolluted river or stream or puddle. And here are just a couple uh, images of what good habitat looks like for them as we're trying to expand our understanding of where they occur in Vermont. These are woodlands with a couple pine trees, maybe seeps, open water, uh, and typically a lot of ferns. And returning to this figure of how these amphibians overwinter, it has real impact. There are different strategies on when they emerge to migrate this time of year. We always see the frogs migrating first because uh, like folks who have used a root cellar before now, the soil can be extremely insulating. So was it like two weeks, two weekends ago, we had that weird 60 degree day in the middle of March. That might be enough for warmth to penetrate the first couple inches of soil but far below ground where the salamanders are, it would still be quite cold. So we'll often see the frogs uh, migrating first, even arriving at their breeding habitat when there's still a little bit of ice on these pools. Whereas the salamanders arrive a little bit later. Um, but here in Montpelier, we had a bit of a thaw two weeks ago and then another week or two of cold. And now I think things have thought out enough that we'll have a really synchronous migration where we'll have a lot of frogs and a lot of amphibians and a lot of salamanders at the same time. 
the toads are doing an entirely different thing. Uh, they show up like towards the end of May or even into June. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but they've, they've figured out a way to get to the pools very late. But yeah, these are, these are the cues for migration. And as humans, it's hard for us to understand exactly why uh, the salamander crossed the road or exactly why the salamander chose to cross the road then. But it's some combination of increasing soil, air temperature, the snowpack melting away, and those first spring rains. Because they have, like I said earlier, they have to stay moist in order to breathe and be healthy. Um, the spotted salamander migration is really well studied. And this 2009 study found that some of the individuals were regularly going up to a quarter mile through dense woods across all sorts of different habitats to reach their breeding pools. And that's like on average, a typical individual might go more than a quarter mile, but some individuals might go a quarter mile and return to the pool in which they're born, look around, decide it's not for them, and then go to another pool or even another pool. So it, it can be the case because of that, that you'll find a salamander or frog pointing in a different direction. They're trying to go away from the pond when you know that all the salamanders are breeding at this point. And it might be tempting to be like, no salamander, go, go this way. This is where your, your breeding puddle is. But that actually is probably a salamander or frog that is doing a really long distance dispersal. They're going a really long way and carrying their genetic material uh, far, far away. And that can be really important for the genetic diversity and the health of our populations at the landscape scale. So uh, when in doubt, the salamanders and the frogs know best about where to go for migration help them cross the road in the direction they're pointing. And this, this study found that they were able to uh, track every spotted salamander returning to a pool. And they found that almost 90% of them came in over just five days. So it can be the case that when, uh, like, like they say, make hay when the sun shines, the spotted salamanders cross the road when the, when the rain pours. Uh, and it can happen really all at once. Uh, for really exciting, astounding nights. Some of our data, we have folks who go out there for an hour or two and come across a hundred spotted salamanders, a hundred of these little forest leaf dragons that are bigger than my hand. Uh, some really fantastic sites out there. I'm hoping to find another one or two this spring. Um, and this is what that, I was talking earlier about that habitat arrangement because they need two sorts of habitat. They need that breeding habitat, those puddles and pools that uh, they lay their eggs in, and then the baby salamander hatches and eats all the aquatic insects. And they also need that terrestrial, that land habitat, those mixed uh, deciduous and conifer broadly forests above, right next to those wetlands. So this is pretty ideal in terms of habitat arrangement. I say pretty ideal, not exactly perfect, because this pond here looks pretty big to me. I think that that pond doesn't ever dry up and that means that fish can live in it. And it turns out that if you're a baby salamander about the size of the end of your thumb, uh, it can be a pretty scary world if the pond you're living in is big enough for there to be fish because fish can be ferocious and they are known to eat just anything that will fit in their mouth. And unfortunately for baby salamanders, baby salamanders are quite a bit smaller than some fish mouths. So the true uh, perfect habitat for a lot of these amphibians um, at the very beginning of their lives and when they're breeding are vernal pools. Definitions can fluctuate based on where you look for vernal pools, but the really important part is that they dry up at some point in the summer or in the fall or like every other year. And that allows for them to remain fish free. Um, so that those uh, baby salamanders can become that figurative big fish in a little pool. Um, and this figure over here comes from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies Vernal Pool Atlas Project, where they have used uh, different technologies and different reports, um, different maps of uh, geological layers and hydrology to piece together where all these vernal pools or potential vernal pools are located within the state. I was talking with Kristen earlier and she was saying that there might be a vernal pool behind uh, the field farm and forest school. Uh, these are great things to check to see if they're recorded on the vernal pool atlas site because uh, you can report them there or uh, these different dots 
uh, signifying different things that you can see. Um, Mark is asking in the chat what the color coding is. I can't remember off the top of my head. I know that the blue ones are ones that have been visited by a biologist and confirmed. Um, but most of these, I think the orange ones are just, excuse me, ones that were predicted through, uh, through their mapping project to be vernal pools. But then you need people on the ground to go out there and see what sort of animals are in there, or even just to go out there in the spring, see that it's wet, and then go out there in the fall and see that it's dry to know that it's for sure a vernal pool. Because these are the sorts of things that we want wrapped into conservation in like town plans or like with state conservation funding. Uh, because they're really rich part of our biodiversity and really important for these amphibians we're talking about tonight. Um, I, now, I had a look at yeah. that atlas that you put in the chat for me earlier. Yeah. Um, I poked around in there for a bit and there's a there's a lot that were identified through aerial yeah. or whatever. And I think you were right. If it gets the yellow are from aerial, um, they, they, theoretically there should be a vernal pool, but I think the red ones have been visited. So there's a guy in, or I don't know, somebody in Sutton who has a bunch identified. I think there's this little red cluster. Up oh, cool. So, um, and it has the name of the person too. It's kind of fun. Like, is that Eric? Oh, I can't remember, but I just remember there was a name and it's definitely been on the ground. You know, cool. Sure yeah. That there's a vernal. That, that's, that's, uh, I used to work with uh, VC and uh, I know we had a, some volunteers and some uh, conservation biologists in loon biology up in that corner of the state. I was wondering if that might be Eric's work. Uh, but this, this project we're talking about tonight, the amphibian road crossing project is just about adult uh, frogs and salamanders migrating. And conservation of these species has to happen at all life stages as eggs and as juvenile salamanders and frogs in the vernal pools as during migration and also as adults in their forest habitat. Uh, so if you wanna plug into a different um, community science project, VCE has some great, that's the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, has some great resources here where you can do some vernal pool mapping or even visit a vernal pool throughout the spring and summer to see exactly the fate of all the animals that end up there. Um, and those are fantastic. They're fantastic folks and fantastic projects to get um, to get more involved in this work and to get your your feet wet and see eggs and baby salamanders. It's it's really exciting stuff. Um, but these are vernal pools. These are our um, you might think of them as glorified puddles. I think of them as truly glorious puddles because they're so good for amphibians. And right now, I think we're probably at that like second from the left phase where as the snow melts and the ice melts, these pools fill, fill, fill up with meltwater. And then it takes months and months for them to dry out. And by the end of the summer, hopefully all the salamanders and frogs have grown their legs and are ready to live on land. Uh, and then um, any frog or any fish eggs that end up in there are a little bit out of luck and it remains great habitat for amphibians the next year. The fish have the lakes, the fish have the rivers, the fish have some of the bigger ponds. I think it's only fair to let the amphibians have these temporary puddles in our woods. So in breeding, the spotted salamander, uh, which I'm hoping is coming out from underground tonight here in Montpelier, the males tend to emerge first and really synchronously. They'll, they'll often all come out in the, the same couple days and they trek down to these uh, forested pools and they lay uh, what's called a spermatophore. They put down a little pedestal that's about that tall of mucus, white mucus on the bottom of these pools. And they'll deposit a small sperm packet, but it's actually large enough. You can see it with your naked eye if you look really closely. And they'll put that on the, forest, on the, the floor of these vernal pools. Then as the females arrive, the males will do this like salamander dance to try to catch the female's attention and then direct them to their spermatophore, uh, being like, hey, look, look how healthy and big of a, of a salamander I am. Uh, and if the female is convinced, she'll go, she'll follow that male to his uh, spermatophore and then she can crawl over the ground and the bottom of the pool uh, to accept 
um, that sperm to fertilize her eggs. And we actually have a little bit of footage. Yeah. I have two, two clips here. This is what vernal pools look like during peak breeding season uh, in the spring. That's just like dozens and dozens and dozens of spotted salamanders. I think, yeah, there's a newt in there somewhere. Nice, a little bit of a swimming dance. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that you might find uh, if you get your hand, your face in a vernal pool. And that was shot actually from, uh, from the road during one of these amphibian road crossing surveys. So hopefully there's some great breeding habitat right next to the survey transect for y'all. And then this next video, i to make sure the sound works. You can hear two species of frog in here. That peep, peep, peep is a spring peeper. And then below that, you can hear kind of a deeper like duck-like quacking. That's the wood frog. Uh, so these vertical pools and these ponds and pools can be really, really noisy places. And just absolutely phenomenal to watch. I could watch that all night, but it's time to talk about frogs. Uh, the wood frog arrived. We could hear them with those uh, spotted salamanders. Uh, they're one of the first frogs to call in spring along with the spring peeper, and they're truly explosive breeders. They return really early to these vernal pools. Uh, we've had some reports of them hopping over snowbanks uh, and into pools that still have some ice on them. Um, they're just exceptionally well adapted to the cold. They're one of the, they're, I think they might be the furthest north reaching amphibian uh, in North America. And the males will hold on to the back of the females for, for hours in a grip called amplexus with their little frog fingers. Uh, and then as the female lays eggs, they'll release sperm to uh, fertilize over 700 eggs that will either float around in the vernal pool or might be uh, anchored to the bottom or to some vegetation. And the four-toed salamander has a different strategy. Well, the typical strategy for amphibians is to lay their eggs in water because they need that water to hydrate their eggs and to provide uh, oxygen to the developing embryo, uh, four-toed salamanders have developed a different strategy. They still need that moisture, but they have adapted to lay their eggs deep, deep, deep in uh, inches of sphagnum moss where it absorbs the water from rain like a sponge. And they'll lay just like four to maybe a, a dozen or 18 eggs and curl up around them in the sphagnum moss above ground, above water. And then when those teeny tiny baby ha salamanders hatch, they just wriggle out of the sphagnum moss. And very often the sphagnum moss is overhanging on a log so that they just plop out into the pond uh, to begin their life. And that way, when they're eggs, they aren't uh, subjected to being eaten by the little bugs that the baby salamanders might eat, or even like leeches and beetles um, have been known to go after uh, frog and salamander eggs. And while I showed this as the ideal arrangement of habitat with that forested woodland right next to a wetland, uh, all too often it looks more like this, where we do have a, a wetland and we have some nice forests, uh, but too often as, as the state is developed and where we need to drive around to get places, uh, a road bisects those. There's a road between them. And that means that unfortunately, in this next slide, I have some caution signs uh, because the next slide shows some squished salamanders. So look away now if you'd like to. Okay, this is unfortunately something that does happen on our roads. Um, and it can be pretty significant because it's a, it's a tough life out there for frogs and salamanders. They're being eaten by all sorts of different things and just 10% of them getting squished on the road uh, can mean that that population um, can be, uh, lo become locally extinct. So we're really trying to prevent that. And that is where you come in. In the amphibian road crossing program, uh, that's 
our community science project here at North Branch Nature Center and now here in the Northeast Kingdom with Field Farm and Forest. Our ARC program has four goals. The first one is to increase, increase public engagement in amphibian conservation. That's what we're all doing tonight. So we can all give ourselves a pat on the back for caring about our non-human neighbors. Two is to directly decrease amphibian mortality at road crossing sites. Just getting folks out there on roads, helping escort these uh, amphibians across the road can really help those local populations. Then as we collect that data, as we count where the amphibians are having a good doing a good job and where they're having a lot of road collisions, we can use that data to inform transportation planning um, at the local level. It turns out the state uh, VTRANS and like a lot of maybe even conservation commissions like have the money to put in wildlife crossing uh, structures where salamanders and other animals could go under the road or over the road. Uh, but it can be really expensive to gather all to pay biologists to gather all that data about where they should put them. Uh, so sometimes it can just be the case that having this data means that like then it can happen and right in our backyards. And fourth, we wanna to contribute to state biodiversity research. Um, we have hundreds of volunteers collecting at hundreds of sites. And that's something that like academic institutions, no ecology lab has the funding to pay 230 technicians to go out there during you know, those first days in April where it's raining after 6 p.m. Um, so we have like a really, we have a really like key opportunity here to get a better understanding of uh, where these animals occur. Actually, uh, just the other day, I was talking with someone at the Vermont Herp, Herp Atlas, that's uh, amphibians and reptiles. Um, and they're saying that after looking at our data, they found new occurrences of the species that we're uh, interested in, in five Vermont towns where they'd never been recorded before. Um, and that's just from like two or three years of data. Uh, so we're, we're really glad that we can contribute to, to state level research in that way. And this is what some on the ground impact might look like. Folks are always, road commissions are always needing, especially after big uh, weather events like Sandy or Irene, to replace culverts. And just uh, knowing where to put a particularly bigger culvert uh, can be something that really influences how wildlife move across the landscape. And we've already had some great successes. Here uh, we have uh, photos of a uh, wildlife crossing structure down in Moncton, where you can see in the bottom left is a wetland and the top right is a woodland. And as the amphibians come out, well, we'll go from when they're returning from the breeding habitat and going to the adult habitat, they come out, they hit this wall and they either turn left and actually there's a turnaround structure, a little loop-de-loop -loop, that'd make them go this way. And then they follow this wall uh, until they go underneath the road safely here. And folks have put cameras up and seen all sorts of things, not just salamanders, not just frogs, but also bobcats, uh, deer, uh, coyotes, foxes, all sorts of different animals are using this and avoiding any danger of uh, road collisions. And here we have a video of one of those salamander movement nights and they just show up as little black dots here, but each of those is a salamander. Um, just dozens and dozens, hundreds of them crossing here under the road in Moncton. And we've had uh, on a smaller scale, like really immediate impacts where folks have gone to one of these arc, one of these amphibian road crossing sites that's normally has a lot of amphibians at it. And they looked and they saw that uh, a silt fence was put up. There's a construction project. And if you've seen those black little fences that um, people will put up at construction sites to avoid dirt washing away into the rivers, which is good. Um, they noticed that salamanders and frogs would go up and then hit that and not be able to cross the road. So they just like made a call, uh, sent an email that night, made a call in the morning, um, and the construction folks were able to just cut little frog-sized holes in it, uh, and it became permeable, and the frogs and salamanders could cross the road. Uh, so just having folks out there and seeing, monitoring these sites year to year is really powerful uh, for the conservation of these species. Uh, and here is where you come in and participate. Oh gosh, we have some fantastic models here. Uh, we didn't get to talk about the spring peeper, but they're teeny tiny frogs with that classic X on their back. And we have some fantastic 
frog holding technique here, that gentle cupped hand, and then very importantly, the covering hand so the frog can't hop out. And below, this is that dazzling spangled belly of the four-toed salamander with proper technique, gra grasping it by the belly to not endanger the tail. Uh, so the rest of our presentation tonight is just how to get directly involved. And uh, of course, I have tried to cover as much as I can in this presentation, but I will certainly have forgotten something. Uh, so we have a written volunteer manual on our website, northbranchnaturecenter.org slash amphibian conservation. Uh, and I can pop that in the chat at the end as well. Uh, but that has full species profiles of all 10-ish species that we monitor. Uh, so you can get the, the technical, the nitty gritty, the very important details of how this survey works from there. But then you visit our amphibian road crossing map to find a site. This is a screenshot from there where there are these dots uh, where red means no data yet, yellow, uh, there are a couple data points, and then green, um, we have quite a bit of data from there. And let me stop. Oh, wait, oh, I don't want to stop. Um, I'm going to share this screen. And Okay, can you see a web map here? Give me a thumbs up. Great, so this is around your area. Let's go to one of these sites and you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. And when you get really zoomed in, you'll start to see this pink line. And that pink line is where exactly the transect is, the place that we want you to walk and count amphibians on. This one starts at uh, the north, what is that? The northwest entrance to the Burktown School. And you walk along that road uh, until the bridge at Hayden Crossing. Um, that might be a little busy road if folks want uh, a less traveled site. Go out to Doloff Pond Road, uh, where I assure you there will be no cars at night. Um, and as you zoom in, you can click on these and you can see all sorts of information. Right now, we don't have any surveys in your region because I just put these sites up today. Um, but there's a description of where to start and end your survey and the name of the road. Um, at sites where we do have data, uh, you can see really rich uh, information. Let's go to this site in Craftsbury. Here we can click on the yellow dot. See that two people, there have two, been two surveys done here. Jay D'Agostino gets the prize for being there the most. So any of you folks can get your name on a site on our website. Uh, and you can see how many traff, how many cars went by in an hour, 17.8. That's a lot of cars uh, for this site and 32.4 amphibians per hour. And then there's a yes, a Y for every species encountered. So this wouldn't be a good place to find a Jefferson salamander, but you can find some spotted salamanders there. Um, and then let's find a quieter road. So that had 17.4 cars per hour. If we go down here, oh man, this is, this is a true gem of a site. Kara, yeah. Kara has counted 1,006 amphibians here of eight species and she'll find 88.4 amphibians per hour on average. Um, this is the place to go if you're ever down by North Duxbury. Um, but as your data is entered, um, those, those sites will automatically update uh, so that folks around you can know where is a good place to go. Okay, so returning back to the slideshow. Once you understand uh, your site and where your transect starts and ends, uh, you can go out there and visit your site on a rainy night. Um, it's hard to tell exactly when amphibians will be moving, but we have a couple uh, like broad guidelines. One, we typically say they start moving around April 1st, which uh, that's, that's now. Uh, and they move on 
we, you want most of the snow to be gone. There can still be big snow banks along roads, um, but most of the snow cover in the forest gone. Um, you want it to be raining or at least quite wet and you want it to be dark. Oh, and around or over 40 degrees. They have, these are cold blooded animals and they have a hard time moving uh, when it's particularly cold. Then walk your transect, uh, go from one end of it. And as you go, go from one end of it, writing down all the amphibians that you see. And then when you get to the end, flip your data sheet over or get out a new data sheet and do another data sheet for the return uh, voyage. So you want two data sheets per full lap, one for out, one for back. And here's what our data sheet looks like. We do ask uh, two things. One, that you, you photograph the rare ones. Um, that's the four-toed salamander, the blue-spotted salamander, the Jefferson salamander, and then a hybrid between the Jefferson and blue salamander. And those, uh, there are photos and description of those available in the protocol. So that's a great thing to print and bring out with you into the, the forest. Um, but you're also just welcome to take a photograph of any species uh, that you don't know about and just leave a comment on your data sheet saying, I submitted a photo, I don't know what this was, maybe it was a spring peeper, maybe it was a wood frog. And we can look at that and like, you know, move those numbers to the right category for you. And then we also ask that you remove and count road killed amphibians. That can be really important information for conservation planning. They wanna put in the wildlife crossing structures where as macabre as it is, where there are the most squish amphibians, where there are big populations that, and a lot of car traffic. Uh, you also wanna get those road killed amphibians off the road so that those hungry raccoons and possums, things going out there to maybe have a salamander snack tonight, aren't drawn to the road and aren't having a snack uh, when a Volvo comes around the corner. And uh, we suggest you could either scrape them off with your boot or we actually uh, do suggest that you bring out a spatula that you never intend to use for food again so you can fling it off into the woods uh, without getting your hands dirty. And we do have waterproof data sheets. Uh, Kristen, I can be in touch with you about uh, mailing you some. We've printed these on right in the rain paper um, which, yeah, forest, you could get out of a forestry supply store or, uh, you know, some outdoor programs have right in the rain journals if you can raid your homeschoolers uh, school journal. Um, but yeah, this is, this is photos of Zach writing underneath a sink full of water. Um, there, it's fantastic, a fantastic product, but you can also like try to carefully cover a normal piece of paper. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch, Kristen, about sending you some data sheets. Super. Uh, and then after you have all your data from the field, congratulate yourself. And then to get that into our database and informing local and state conservation, um, enter it at home on your computer or even on your field in the field on your phone. Um, and a link to that data upload for uh, data upload form is on our website at North Branch naturecenter.org slash amphibian conservation. And then congratulate yourself for helping amphibians at your site and across Vermont. Um, a couple notes on safety before we go. Uh, to keep the amphibians safe, we want folks to have clean, wet, and low hands. And I say clean with an asterisk because that doesn't mean clean with uh, hand sanitizer. These amphibians are covered in a mucous membrane, just like our mouths or even our eyes. Uh, so think of uh, like, getting uh, rubbing alcohol or getting hand sanitizer in your eyes would be really painful or like getting anything spicy there. So like the way to have clean hands is to wash your hands with soap and water at home and really, really rinse them well. Um, and then avoid like touching things spicy. You don't have Flaming Hot Cheetos as a snack in the car. Uh, and actually don't wear bug spray. It, there aren't bugs out this time of year quite yet anyway, but bug spray can actually be really harmful to amphibians when you're handling them. And we say handle only when necessary. Yes, if they're almost all the way across the road, uh, they can probably make it all on their own. Uh, but I do think if you have never picked up that kind of amphibian before, uh, that's a necessary form of nature connection, especially uh, if you're a kid. Uh, we love having kids with hands-on salamanders. Uh, and then keep yourself safe. 
bring flashlights and extra batteries. Um, you get reflective safety vests and clothes. We have some at North Branch if you're coming through uh, Montpelier that you can borrow. Uh, it's also worth checking in with uh, local libraries or um, oftentimes road commissions uh, will have extra ones to give out or just like, you know, your reflective running attire. Um, crossing signs are great. Um, it's important for those crossing signs to say, it's great to say salamander crossing and have cute signs with salamanders drawn on them. But the really important thing is that drivers know that there's humans in the road. Uh, so maybe say something like research in progress, uh, community scientists ahead, um, everything you need to be comfortable in the rain, a camera or smartphone to take photos of the rare ones, that spatula that's not for food anymore uh, for the dead amphibians and a clean bucket can be great. Uh, for one, you can put an amphibian that you wanna spend a little time with in a bucket or a Tupperware uh, so that you can hold it you can look at it without handling it directly and stressing it out. They'll pretty much just chill in a puddle or in the bottom of a bucket. And if you move them after 10, 20 minutes of hanging out and looking at them, they're no, no worse for the wear. To have them in your hands that long uh, could be stressful to those animals. And also at some sites like uh, that site on River Road where they had 88 amphibians per hour, sometimes just having a bucket to just put amphibians in to like make one trip across the road uh, can actually be really helpful on some of these really uh, productive amphibian road crossing nights. Oh, and these folks are doing a great job demonstrating uh, proper uh, flashlight etiquette. If a car does come, it's great to shine the flashlight at yourself so the driver isn't blinded and instead uh, they can see you lit up well and very obvious. Um, yeah, those are the things for safety. Oh, uh, when, when folks are coming, when a car is coming, uh, leave the amphibians aside and do step all the way off the road. Um, we want people, we want amphibians to safely cross the road, but we really, really want all the people that we're working with um, to have a safe night out there. Uh, in 2021, we had 220 surveys done, 539 volunteer efforts for 331 hours. They found over 5,000 amphibians, which wasn't even close to one of our records. Last year, there was probably about the same number of amphibians as there were in 2020. But last year, all the spring rains we got had this awful tendency to start at like three or four in the morning. So amphibian migration just happened while we were all sleeping. And like, I have every intention tonight to go out at about 9 p.m. and stay out till two in the morning, but waking up at two in the morning to go look for amphibians is just something I've never been able to do. So we're hoping that we have nice early evening rains like this uh, this year and we get a lot more amphibians. So last year, uh, the our data sheet scores um, rain from a zero to a four, four being a downpour, zero being no rain. Last year, it averaged only like 1.26 uh, because folks just, all the downpours happened at 3 a.m. So we're hoping we have some downpours, some very wet volunteers uh, and a lot of salamanders crossing when people can see them. Uh, now what? Get signed up, get out on rainy nights. Uh, tonight might be a good one on some of those Southern aspects up there. Um, and I bet I bet there will be peepers and wood frogs out uh, if folks wanna get out there. So yeah. I'll uh, happy to answer any questions that folks have and drop some of those links in the chat. So I guess my question, Pete, is, um, you know, are we, are we kind of on our own in terms of going out or, or maybe I should spearhead a way to maybe have emails of everyone and say, you know, tonight's the night and I'm gonna be at the Willoughby or whatever, you know, the, the Dolliff Pond site or something like that. Yeah, you join me. yeah. we yeah. really appreciate it. We really appreciate how, well, the way that we've set it up, we kind of shifted things around uh, during COVID so that just households, any person can go on our website, find a site and just like do it when it suits their schedule. Mm -hmm. But we really love having local partners uh, with the emails of like all the people around so that this can be like a fun, like 
community aspect. We have uh, folks in the Mad River Valley going out with the Mad River Valley libraries. And I think they're expecting like 35 people at some of these back roads. Uh, and like a lot of them, actually a lot of the uh, kids I work with uh, at the Moortown School, um, students going out to do this amphibian road crossing. So yeah, if you, um, you can get Kristen your email directly, um, or if you go to our website, let's see. Oh, I stopped share. That's not what I wanted to do. Um, and I might have them from that Google form. If yeah. Here. If you go to our website, uh, you can join our amphibian crossing guard mailing list. Um, and then as you fill all that out, if you tick, yeah. are you part of a local regional arc team? If you tick this, uh, it's really easy for me to get your information to Kristen uh, right away. Or, you know, uh, yeah, share, I actually share, have the, to share the link to this form in front porch forum, post it in the general store um, and get a lot of folks together to, to meet, out, meet up on rainy nights. It's great to have a lot of people because if you get a lot of people, someone will certainly bring coffee and someone will certainly bring mm -hmm. hot chocolate. Great. And that's only, so like if a bunch of people, let's say showed up, well, not a bunch, well, let's say like a couple families or whatever, yeah. you were walking that transect there and back yeah yeah and yeah so uh the data assumes that you all go out as one group as so one group. If, you, if you have like a couple families just like you know it actually it can be really nice to have like a person every couple feet uh because the spring peepers they're really little um and they move actually quite well so it can be hard to catch them hard to see them uh so just walk as like one big line filling up one data sheet and then turn around um, and do the same. I've gone with five people before and needed every single one of them. Wow, great. Um, I've also gone out uh, with just one other person and you know we found four wood frogs and we're like, well, but those actually, if you go out and you don't see any amphibians, like do submit a data sheet um, just full of zeros because knowing when they're not migrating is just as important for us uh, as knowing when they are migrating. Um, Cause then you can figure out what is important for them. Mm -hmm. And you can go back to that site at a, at a later date, right? Yeah. Like maybe yeah. it's just a little bit too cold or something yeah. at night. Okay, great. Great. Well, this is exciting. And I'm, I'm really excited that, um, that this little community is starting. And, you know, I have all of your emails, everybody. And so I can just send out, a, you know, if you want to be part of a group, let me know if you want to be totally on your own and that's fine. Um, I'm just glad that our organ, our nonprofit is able to kind of help get this started because as you guys all saw, there's not one survey that's happened in the NEK yet. So we need some different colored dots on that map for sure. And, and I actually talked to Pete, like if I come up with more sites because my husband's a county forester, maybe we can brainstorm and he's got his maps. If there's another dot that Pete could put on the map, they'll do so. So we'll just make sure, you know, before the first rainy night, um, there might be more options, in other words, for transects that are not there right now. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I was telling Kristen that uh, I, I put together those sites, like doing my best to look at wetlands and roads from uh, the bird's eye view from satellite imagery, but folks on the ground know both where the pools are. Actually, the pools can be pretty easy to see from satellites, but they definitely know where the traffic is. Um, so yeah, if you have um, if you have a site, you can uh, click on that last form that I dropped in the chat, um, which is also on our amphibian conservation page on our website, um, and submit submit a site. And when you are submitting your data, uh, feel free to comment on the site. Um, we want to put these sites in places that people want to go to um, and that are important for the amphibians. If you're, if you think that there aren't any amphibians around, or if you think that, you know, there's too much traffic, let us know. And, uh, you know, we can move, move sites around um, so that it fits the community and the, the, the people who are doing this work. Great. Well, Great. well, thanks so much for all the time you've spent so far 
helping us get this started up here. So we really appreciate it. And um, great. Yeah, well, I see a hand from uh, some data. Yep. <laughs> it's Austria. <laughs> All right. Um, and Cyrus and Tana. So we are homeschooling and we actually in Warren kind of up on the mountain. So we're really close to Sugarbush. And um, I just had a question because we have heard. So last year when we were up here for the first year, there was a ton of frog. We saw salamanders also on the yeah. road. Um, and then in our yard in August, <laughs> there were so many. And we kept joking. It's like we live in a swamp. <laughs> so, and I um, but up the hill from us, there's a little, they technically created it artificially as like a fire um, water pool, yeah. basically. But that seems to have a lot of amphibian activity. Yeah. So, I mean, good place to go check out, or is that, I mean, there's also, there's quite a bit of wetland kind of vernal pools here in the woods. So I'm sure there's a lot going on. Um, but does it make sense? I mean, we're on a dirt road. Right now, there is some construction, so there's some daytime traffic. Otherwise, it's pretty quiet. Like, we're the only ones yeah. who are full time here. Um, so, would it make more sense for us to go towards Warren, Waitsfield, like a different location? Um, yeah. like a, or does it make sense to look here? I think, uh, well, go to, if you go to that map, you can see if we have any established sites uh, right, right out your door. Okay. Um, oh. I see one in Warren on um, uh, on Lincoln Gap Road uh, okay. that no one's gone to before. That'd be awesome to know about. But also, like, if there's a site right out your door that we have good information on, it can just be. Uh, I I think that it's a bit of like a sliding scale between. Um, I I intend to go out to a site that we don't have any data on on like a way way back out. Uh, gravel road because it looks like great habitat. I want to see a lot of salamanders and get a little bit of data just on where they occur. Uh, and I know that it'll be safe and I don't need to worry about a truck coming around the corner at 60 miles per hour at 11 p.m. Um, so especially like if I'm going out with like a larger group or, or with or with kids, I try to go to the less trafficked roads where if I'm uh, like, yeah, you're going to like impact the individual lives of salamanders and frogs more maybe if you're going somewhere that where there is some nocturnal traffic but um yeah it's 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 personal preference and knowing like um your your safety and and what the what the traffic is like locally there are some sites on here that we've put onto a document that we're calling internally our wall of shame um that folks just don't want to go to because it's too uh busy and we're just gonna we're gonna end up taking them off the the survey site because we don't want uh, we don't want, want folks putting themselves in danger. Um, okay, no, that makes. I mean, so maybe we can do kind of a combination now. Yeah. Here, actually, to... I'll uh, let me go back to that map. Um, this is right here in. Oh, let me get up to Montpelier. Uh, we have this really funny situation here in Montpelier where uh, we have two sites. This is uh, route, is that route two? No, 14. Uh, that's really busy. And we have two sites right next to each other. And this one has eight surveys and no one <laughs> has thought that this one's a good idea to go to yet. Um, and I'd agree. Uh, so that might be one that we end up uh, taking off our surveys. Um, Great. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to stop recording and uh, probably end here. So we can all maybe review that uh, protocol and mm -hmm. get out and see if things are moving or just go for a nice walk in the rain and have our ears cast out for spring peepers and wood frogs. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for all Great. your time. Yeah, thanks for thanks for organizing. Same tonight. Thank you for um for for coming around and share maybe 